And uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us for our 23rd Security Thought Leadership webinar. This is the place where every Tuesday and Thursday we debate, we examine an issue pertinent to the security world, where we like to examine what's going on now in order we get a better security in the future. And as always, I've got an international panel with me uh, looking at security from different aspects. In a minute, I'm going to invite them to uh, um, uh, um, introduce themselves. Uh, and once they've introduced themselves, I'm then going to um, ask them each for an opening statement and then I'll come to you, the audience. And so the topic today, resuming effective business operations post COVID-19, what role changes for security and business continuity management, if any? And this topic has been a big one. So I'm very grateful to business as usual for uh, supporting uh, uh, and sponsoring this particular uh, topic. It's a big one because it's been cropping up on previous webinars. So uh, with that, I'm now going to thank, uh, um, thank them and move to my panel. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves very briefly. And once they've done that, I'll then uh, invite each of them to make an opening statement. And then we come to you, the audience, to ask questions. Please use your question and answer button at the bottom of your panel to ask questions. So let's go first to uh, Shannon. Shannon, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. My name's uh, Shannon. I'm a Senior Managing Director at a uh, global consulting firm called Ankara. Uh, previous to that, I led uh, Deloitte's Federal Gov uh, cyber risk business in Australia. And uh, before that, I uh, was um, the CEO of my, uh, my own company uh, based out of San Diego, uh, Sydney and Singapore, uh, where we worked in uh, risk management and uh, cyber security as well. Uh, and I have um, been doing this for about 10 years now. Previous to that, I was in the military. Sandra, thank you very much indeed. So from Australia over to the Netherlands, where we've got Glenn. Glenn, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm uh, Glenn Schoon, Dutch-American, working from the Netherlands. Um, I'm CEO of my own company, Boardroom at Crisis, for security and crisis management services. And I have roughly uh, 30 years international experience in the uh, security and crisis fields. Thank you very much indeed, Glenn. We've got uh, Stephen from Uganda who's got trouble connecting. So I'll skip Stephen for a minute and uh, back to Australia. And uh, Rinske, can you please introduce yourself, please? Rinske. Sure. My name is Rinske Zerlings. Uh, I'm a founder and still the kind of CEO of Business as Usual. Uh, consultancy firm uh, focusing mainly on business continuity planning, also quite a bit of information security and risk management these days. And I'm very uh, happy to be on this panel, really enjoy uh, working with Martin on this and uh, with my fellow panel members uh, who I invited all from across the globe. So uh, let's uh, make it a really good one. And let's try to get Stephen on, uh, on the audio as well. I think he seems to be connecting now. So um, Stephen, are you there, well? Stephen? Are you there? But I'll tell you what, we'll go for our opening statements and we'll come to Stephen straight afterwards, okay? So um, let's get going. Uh, let's go to Shannon, please. Shannon, your opening statement, please. Sure, you know, this is an important topic, I think, um, and, and we'll dive into it more as the questions come in. But uh, I believe in this post covidian world, uh, we're seeing that the issues that we've always faced as a security industry, both protective and cyber security, where I focus, um, it's gone on to highlight issues we already face and to exacerbate some where businesses have been forced to focus on business critical operations, reduction and optimization of costs, which has caused it to be even more important for us to be able to communicate how our own services and our own strategy around security and business continuity need to align with the overall business strategy in order to be effective and to receive the investment that it is due. So it's a, it's a particularly important topic for um, us as an industry. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, let me now go to Glenn. Glenn, uh, your opening statement, please. All right. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I think if we look at the general situation, the crisis we find ourselves in because of COVID-19 and all the follow-on results, um, clearly there's going to be more trouble to come. And when you look at physical security right now, I think it's one of only six basically strategic assets that an organization has to protect itself. Uh, physical security, cybersecurity, 
um, legal compliance, um, uh, safety, and business continuity crisis management. So the first thing I think we need to do when we talk about a role change is to see ourselves as a strategic asset, particularly given that the core of the threat, COVID-19, is literally actually a physical threat. Um, when we talk about the key roles now, the strategic roles or the strategic tasks of security, I think we can look at four of them. One is to support the business while it's in transition. So that means facilitating the reopening, helping with the new work environment, the work from home, whether that's awareness or actually on the shop floor. It's enforcing health safety uh, and compliance. I mean, it also means for us the need to track what those requirements are. So we know at all times what security has to be doing and to enable crisis management right now operationally. If tomorrow at the restart, the plant in the next town goes down and needs a deep clean for three days, that means maybe 200 people who have never been there need to go in the door and do things that have never been done there. And security is going to have to be the one to facilitate that whole process. The other three big strategic tasks outside of helping the business in the transition is to do a strategic monitoring function on behalf of the crisis management for risk. So to specialize and to look at what security risks are there to make them aware, to make them be able to look forward. Think about particularly the downturn in the economy that we're living through and it's going to get worse. I think the third one is to prepare to react to some of these changes, whether it's needing to be able to fly out to a different country with a security team or adapt some new form of risk assessment but we have to prepare for the new service delivery in new areas and new ways um, that might be ahead of us. And the fourth one is, I think we're gonna have to strengthen our role as the forward defense of an organization. Whether you're a company that's in 60 countries or you're operating only in one at 80 different facilities, um, when we look at things like due diligence and investigations, they're gonna be increasingly important because so much now is happening at a distance and virtually, and we're all gonna be dealing with new partners and new stakeholders as we shrink, as we reshape our businesses. In closing, uh, if we look at the new expertise and skills that are needed, first I would say we're all gonna to need to be better in security at general management skills. We're gonna to have to be able to connect with that boardroom a lot more, uh, go back to business school class, make sure we understand the main components of the business, the second one is we're going to have to enable crisis management a lot more. Recent survey I looked at about 35 new key risks now because of COVID-19 and 12 or fully one third of them are related directly to security. So you're going to be a key enabler for crisis management. I would also say we need to strengthen our capability in terms of remote tech, everything that's going virtual, everything that's going touchless, everything that's going at a distance. We're gonna to have to learn to operate more on the Google model, where from headquarters remotely over big distances, we're gonna be able to monitor and help secure facilities. And then fourth, we're gonna to need to strengthen our skills in due diligence and investigations and how we do that effectively over great distances. Finally, if we talk about changing role of security, just four key points. One is crisis management is now a executive board level skill. Um, and the chief risk officer is gaining in importance. So I think we're gonna be following some of that and are, gaining, are going to be gaining in importance ourselves. I think we have to be more effective communicators of our activities in security so that the rest of the business knows what we can do for them, what we are doing for them. And finally, I think both vertical integration of the security function throughout a business, more contact with other business units and horizontal integration, more contact and connectivity with safety and compliance in particular looking forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Glenn. Uh, uh, Rinske, your opening statement, please. Go beyond your mute, Rinske. Yes. Um, look, I, uh, I come from a, like I said, mainly a business continuity kind of perspective. Um, what I've seen uh, uh, and what I'd like to see different from COVID to the era is, uh, first of all, think more as businesses about slow onset scenarios. I mean, everybody's been making business continuity plan for the big bang, for you know, the big power failures, floods, fires, etc. But not this kind of where we've had, uh, yeah, the, the COVID situation evolving over a number of days, weeks, and, and even months. So. 
that's uh, that's one really important uh, important aspect. Um, I mean, I've even seen businesses not even invoking their crisis management team, for example. You know, not even uh, thinking about that, even though this is a serious uh, business impact clearly uh, on uh, all of the whole the whole uh, industry globally uh, is, is impacted and we're not even thinking about uh, invoking the CMT. That kind of a situation I've seen because it was just a, such a strange scenario. Um, the second uh, insight I'd like to have people more uh, over the future is um, keep their plans re really, really simple and not uh, the thousands of pages, death by, uh, word document, uh, tick, uh, what do you call it, tick in the box type approach, uh, pleasing auditors. I mean, that doesn't help people with the next scenario that might happen. Uh, even while we're still uh, semi in, uh, um, in, in lockdown mode, and, and quite a few countries are in full lockdown mode, uh, the scenario of losing the internet, for example, now, is, uh, is uh, of, of course a huge impact scenario that a lot of businesses are sort of hoping that might not happen because uh, they're all working from home and everything is uh, you know all uh, sort of settled at the moment but those kind of uh, situations may still happen and uh, and also after uh, after COVID-19 we hope that uh, the people makes make uh, better plans for those situations and combinations of events with simple checklists and plans and the third one is, yeah, the whole people factor. So quite a few of you have named that, uh, more from a security or safety or health and well-being perspective, but also that whole situation of single points of failure in terms of people who had that in their business continuity plan. I see people make BCPs for, you know, loss of building, loss of IT, but, you know, loss of people or uh, people being fatigued, certain skills not being available for a period of time or staff being distracted with issues at home and not wanting to work even with all the best work from home tools in the world. They're just not wired that way in that particular situation. Make better plans for those situations and uh, yeah, be more prepared for those uh, in the future. That's my, my three main, uh, main insights. Thank you very much indeed. Well, a lot of information there. Let me just see if, Stephen, are you on the line from Uganda? Let's just see if he's there. He's popping in and out. I know he's having connection problems. Um, if not, we'll, we'll come back to him as soon as we can. Um, question and answers, don't forget, bottom of the bottom of your screen. Here's your chance to ask some questions. Um, and I'm going to go to Peter Fraser Ho uh, Hopewell, who's um, attended many of these sessions over time. And, uh, um, uh, and I'm going to go to um, uh, you first, uh, uh, Shannon, if I might. And his point is, with the anticipated reductions in many workforces, um, um, it's all very well to talk about the, the role of security in reducing risk. I mean, this theory is coming through. The question is, is it up for the task? Uh, um, uh, there's, there's this sense, isn't there, that it shines in a crisis. We've heard on previous webinars, only some people think that it is. Shannon, your thoughts? I think the community and the skill set available is definitely up to the task. In my experience, it's been whether they're utilised correctly. I think that there's a misunderstanding often between um, corporate and uh, particularly cyber security where I work of the actual value add. Uh, oftentimes it's seen as just a cost and oftentimes cyber security um, particularly is um, one of the first heads on the chopping block when it comes to reducing costs, often at the, uh, at the detriment to the overall resilience and um, both uh, risk management standards and the regulatory compliance standards um, that are required by cybersecurity in this day and age. And it's, it, it's difficult to contend with that when you have leadership and boards who have a lack of understanding of the um, potential impacts of um, cyber risks. So it, it comes down to that effective communication from our industry to board and C-suite on the both the value add and our alignment with the overall business strategy. But I don't think it comes down to whether we have the capability or not. Um, the capability is there and there's, there's been, at least in our industry, there's been a, a long discussed apparent skills gap um, where we have a shortage of appropriately qualified cyber staff. Um, personally, I don't think there is a skills gap. I think there's a, uh, a lack of awareness in um, hiring practices of what they need. Everybody's looking for a unicorn, Everybody, someone that can do extremely technical cybersecurity all the way through to briefing boards 
and are an excellent communicator. You know, they're looking for that unicorn and it just doesn't exist and they wonder why they can't find somebody and then they decry this, um, this skills gap, so to speak, and it just doesn't exist. So to answer your question, I, I don't think there is a capability gap and I think we're certainly up to the task, but it's about um, changing our communication approach and our, um, our ability to deliver what we need to um, to fit the current times and also to um, ensure that we adequately communicate our value add. Thank you very much indeed. Just before I come to, to, to Glenn to ask the same question, I'm just going to see if Stephen, Stephen, can you hear us? Stephen, you're on mute. I'm just checking that you can hear us. I know you're trying to get in from Uganda. Um, Stephen, you're oh, on yes. mute. Uh, oh, Stephen, uh, congratulations. Good yes. to see you. Thank you. No, thank you very much. See, we're live. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Steve, we're live to the world. Could you yes, just introduce I... yourself in uh, just 10 seconds and then maybe give us your uh, thoughts, just a few thoughts about this issue uh, uh, we're discussing today. Steve, just introduce yourself first. Okay, my name is Stephen Sandy. Uh, after 25 years, of working in the Central Bank of Uganda as a, I have now moved on to start and establish my own consulting firm called Two Dimension Consulting and we consult in risk management, business continuity and project management. Uh, this is a new company. Now coming to the topic of today, uh, this is something that um, has uh, brought out the risk. In my risk profession and in my risk training, we have established that the biggest risk is the unknown risk. And that has materialized. We have come to the conclusion that this COVID is, was one of those unknown risks which materialized. And it took away all, as risk said, all our planning for disaster recovery and business continuity. Where we are now, we have realized that however planning you may have in place for Stephen, so sorry, we just seem to have lost you. As you do not have the people run the systems and the procedures but as we move forward as I no, we're back we're back you're back carry on you're as, back okay uh, looking forward into the future post covid technology cannot be done away with it we are now moving from being careful about availability to being uh, to be able to run our systems with Steve, we're losing most of your words, so I'm going to just ask you to see if we can sort it out in the background. Um, and while we do that, I'm just going to come to Glenn. Glenn, uh, um, question for you is uh, building on what Shannon has said, uh, Shannon painted quite an optimistic sort of picture about ability. Um, what you presented was a theoretical ideal, Glenn, uh, and the truth of the matter is that many will say, well, in theory, of course, in practice, impossible. It's never going to happen. It's just too much of a theoretical ideal. The skills gap is too big. Glenn. Well, Martin, I think we have to take a good hard look at ourselves and our own capabilities. Did we set up a security group and are we head as the security manager uh, in, in some kind of sizable or mid-sizable organization where we have a clear mandate, we have a department, we have different people who run different functions and are we known as that? If at the moment we only have a security manager with uh, one or two assistants and for the rest it all, for instance, runs through facilities, yes, we're not gonna have much of a strategic role. I'm looking at, if you can, uh, and obviously it's up to your own capabilities, I recall very well you presenting a few years ago at one of the European conferences, you're finding that 
in a survey of CEOs, I think only two to 5% of security managers were seen to have the general management skills to actually become a full-blown leading executive in an organization. So we have to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, are we capable of playing that strategic role? But here's the, here's the thing, it's, it's a physical crisis. So other literally than physical security and physical safety teams assisted by and covering the other side, the, the cyber teams, we're the front line. I mean, right behind that comes, yes, the smart people in compliance and yes, the smart people in legal and yes, business continuity and crisis management are absolutely key in driving all of this. But if you're talking purely about the physical uh, operation, I'd say it's time for you to look at what strategic role can and should you be playing at this moment and to make sure that you're positioning yourself and your capabilities in that way. Here's our risk assessment. Here's our planning. Here's our contribution to business continuity and crisis management. Here's our forward monitoring on making sure that we're prepared to handle the kind of security risks we're going to run into. If you're not doing that, you're right. It's up to the person. So this is a time for us to upskill and also to step up, but to make sure we're not doing it from a position of weakness. But my point is, Glenn, that I'm suggesting it is a position of weakness because this has taken people's surprise, as others have said, as in fact Stephen was just saying, and uh, the skill sets aren't there. It's a theoretical ideal. Well, then I'd say it's time we get the skill sets and it's time that you're a little bit more assertive in thinking about what you can contribute to the whole. If all you're going to be doing is guarding buildings and making sure the close down can be reopened and a certain building can go, uh, maybe you haven't been following what as is OSAC and all these other global organizations have been looking at what a skilled chief security officer should have in his or her pocket and should be working towards. Thank you very much. Let me come to Rinsk. I'm interested in your point on this. Um, and you, I mean, you're, you're one of the points you made was the need to keep, keep things simple. Um, what was what's the key behind keeping it simple? Is it because that's what security needs to follow? Or is it to bring other parts of the organization on board? Because in, in, a, in a sense, it's not a simple process, is it? No, no. And it's certainly not uh, because of security being you know, able to become on board. That's why things need to be kept simple. Not at all. Um, it's more about when people are under pressure or especially in panic mode or, you know, not really dealing with a scenario they've seen before, they need simple checklist instructions things and not with thousands of pages of behaviors, let's say, put in there. Um, when, when you're talking about security, uh, having the, the strategic sort of mindset or the business process sort of mindset and, and, and that, uh, I have to say, especially in Australia, where, where I've done quite a lot of, uh, you know, training delivery, et cetera, and seminars, we get a lot of security people coming to business continuity training, and that's actually a really great thing. And we invite them, uh, especially also to rehearsals, like large scale sort of business continuity rehearsals. The first people I get onto is, is security, physical and cyber, but, but also definitely physical because of their, um, well, there, there are two things. The one is the hands-on kind of approach to these kind of rehearsals, which is really important because many business office environment, environments still think they go by a piece of paper instead of the real experience. Whereas if I involve some, some people from security, um, I usually get far more hands-on exercises out of, uh, out of these business people. So it's for me uh, an absolute benefit to, to integrate those. And, uh, and I think uh, on, the, on the other hand as well, the fact that um, security always look for uh, what Stephen actually was saying, which I actually could understand, uh, looking for those unknown risks, you know, what is behind certain things that people might be thinking, what are criminals trying to do tomorrow, not stuff that we have already seen them do over the last number of years or decades, no, what is the stuff we don't even know should go in our risk matrix, and whether that's cyber related or physical security related, those sorts of scenarios we're now starting to think about also in BCP land. We're not just doing, you know, uh, business impact analysis with lots of uh, spreadsheets anymore. We're actually, especially through COVID, we're starting to really think about how to make this thing real and how to make the people element in there, uh, well, for people so as, as comf comfortable as possible to participate in that and to feel, uh, well, guided by simple frameworks and checklists, as I said before rather than, uh, you know, uh, having a, a bigger job than normal to do, you know, actually uh, reducing that complexity uh, while something goes wrong. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm all for that integration. And quite a few of you have mentioned the integrated approach between, you know, security, business continuity, risk management, uh, even IT or cybersecurity. 
and, and consolidating those uh, sort of working groups. But uh, yeah, absolutely. If that hasn't been clear through this scenario uh, for COVID, well, when will it be clear to people? That's probably my question. You know? um, and and you just one other thing. I've can I add just one thing? Yeah, I've on. seen security, when, when you mentioned oh, security people, yeah, they're standing in front of that building, guarding the building, but I've seen actually now uh, physical security guards actually being involved uh, on the spot in the whole business process. So, uh, for example, customers turning up at a building and finding the buildings now you know, locked off or partially locked down. The security guard is trying to convey messages to that are business related messages, uh, marketing related sort of stuff. And they come up with that on the fly because they haven't been instructed or involved in that process of continuity planning and crisis communication before to that extent, you know? So it's even more important to involve them and to actually s give them that role of passing on those messages, maintaining the reputation of the company, you know, whatever you're, you're uh, where you work, of course. But uh, yeah, I think that, uh, that role is really important. Okay, thank you very much. Let me go to a question from Richard Franklin, who was, um, responding about the change in position. And Shannon, I want to come to you on this. A previous webinar, it was put to the audience that uh, what this crisis is showing is that security is playing second fiddle to business continuity management, crisis management, whatever the, the, the word is in a company. And that these professionals mm -hmm. are leading the way. And that when we get out the other end, it's this, this group of professionals who are going to be seen as the more important and it will take over the security role which is shown to be subservient. Shannon, would you agree with that? I don't think I would actually. I, uh, yes, uh, it has highlighted the need and uh, the importance of crisis management and, and business continuity, but I think the, they both go hand in hand. One doesn't uh, replace the other. They're both as important as each other. Um, crisis management is a key part of uh, cybersecurity and I imagine it's a key part of physical security as well. Glenn would be better qualified to call, uh, comment on his side of the industry, but I don't think it's going to replace it at all. I think it's, uh, I alluded to it before, but I think that um, it, uh, this crisis has highlighted the importance of um, security professionals. Um, you know, in cybersecurity, there's been a quite a significant uptick in malicious activities, uh, activity from cyber criminals and nation states um, targeting organizations. And there's been a dramatic increase in data breaches. And that's not just due to increased malicious activity, but we've had a mass transition to working from home where people have gone to remote working and shadow IT has proliferated like nothing else um, because people are using their own devices. They download whatever software they like to uh, store and uh, communicate corporate data. Um, they get lazy when they're at home and they use lax cybersecurity hygiene. There might not be the security controls in place because a business might be so used to working from the office and they didn't have remote working um, controls in place such as using VPNs and their remote desktop protocols are just mis completely misconfigured because they've had to do it on the fly and that's how cyber criminals get in that's how data breaches occur um, so I think out of that obviously these crises many crises has happened within a crisis um, and it has highlighted the fact that crisis comms and um, incident response plans and business continuity plans are hugely important, but almost entirely the people reacting to those IRPs and BCPs are security professionals. So I, I think it would be nonsensical to say that, um, you know, one would replace the other. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to come back to you Rince, for a question from uh, Gary Shields. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your opening statement the issue about the internet going down and uh, uh, these sort of new risks is something Shannon's just touched on. Uh, um, um, Jerry Shields' question is uh, um, about whether we need uh, new forms of risk assessment uh, um, uh, um, and how should this and how how might that the sector go about generating that? Do we need new forms of risk assessment? And how do we go about responding to that? If I can ask you to be fairly brief, please, uh, Rinsk. Yeah, sure. Um, look, the, the example of uh, the internet going down is just for me a, um, a way to explain to people that Murphy's Law actually exists, right? And that we're now all settled, working from home, 
even lacking the endpoint security and all the things that, that Shannon just highlighted perhaps, but we think we're kind of doing okay business continuity wise. If anything happens to that, uh, you know, where are we then? So what, what I do with risk assessment these days and also with sort of, you know, um, risk appetite workshops, et cetera, is looking at those multiple uh, impacts at the same time, rather than that single uh, incident focus, which we've seen in the past a lot, you know, people going, oh, if there's a, a gas leak or a power failure or a flood, but what about if they're all happening at the same time and, uh, and planning properly for it and simulating that with the right tools to see what the impacts would be, well, what sort of in initial response procedures would be applicable as well, and then which people should be involved, as we talked uh, about earlier. Yeah, so it's Thank more you very of a multi-dimensional approach. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Glenn, let me come to you. Uh, and something that I know that uh, um, you and I have spoken about a, a number of times over the years, but the question actually comes from Charles Olu from uh, Kenya, who was on the panel uh, um, recently. Uh, um, and he's talking about uh, the new training and upskilling that's going to be necessary. And, uh, um, and I suppose mine's a more general question, taking uh, Charles Olu's point, is where are we going to look? What are the new skills and what are the new areas where uh, at, broadly speaking, the security sector has shown to be needing to upskill on, and how might we think about uh, bringing about a change in the way that that's provided? Very briefly, Glenn, a big question, but I'm going to ask you to be brief. You know, at the micro level, I think we're going to have to look at our associations as a means of exchange and our own networks. So we know that uh, certain people are thinking up the new procedures that are needed because they didn't exist before. So literally some thought leaders and practical people are getting together in different countries, different clusters, and then that information needs to be exchanged and we're going to improve and build on that to iterate and iterate and iterate. And that's simple things like how the security guards support a, a health screening at the front door of a headquarters. You know, what do we do with too many people in an elevator? What's the right procedure to get them out? That's the small detail stuff and we need to get upskilled on that. At the higher level, I think, security should look a little bit more and that's what i meant to emphasize here with strategic but what really are the key functions i'm doing not look at it as in my day to day and this is how i divided it up but in terms of what is the business need it needs to be enabled at several levels one is for us to just do our job as security with these new changes but a second thing traditionally security does the intelligence it does a lot of risk assessment so what can it do here to support either with safety or with compliance or on its own to make sure that the risk assessment process to see changing risk evolving, that somebody captures that, measures that, tracks that, relates it to the board, relates it to crisis management, relates it to the risks of the world so we can make sure it's thought about in business continuity and crisis management processes. And it's that second function where I think we're going to be more important. I also see the fact that in the last several weeks we're seeing in headhunting where we're looking at top headhunters who operate globally people in the key risk positions are being much sought after so we know that that's a talent group that the c-suite the, the top executive level and a lot of big corporates a lot of organizations are now looking for we want to strengthen that capability of assessing and managing risk and i think security shouldn't try to be more important than it is or than it should be but it should try to add its full value. And that's a conversation you need to have and you need to be enabled and strong enough to have that conversation. Thank you. I'm going to see if Stephen's back. I'm so keen to get Stephen involved. Stephen, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Perfectly. You're summing through loud and clear. Stephen, I want to get you involved because you've been involved at the very sort of sharp end in these, uh, these issues. Um, yes. One of the things I would really like to get your thoughts on, very briefly if I might, is um, we're talking about uh, how we move forward from here. What have we learnt uh, that we're going to need to think about differently from now? I wonder whether, big question I know, I wonder whether you could just give me your headline thoughts on where we go from here. Uh, Stephen, to you. Um, my, my vision of this is that we, uh, most companies delayed to, st to take on the cloud services because they feared confidentiality issues. Today, we learned that we cannot do without cloud services. But going to cloud services means you have to understand how are we going to be secure from the front end. When people are working from home, 
when you have uh, uh, surrendered your confidentiality to a service provider, the issue, the security issues that come into play include the fact that you have lost control over the end user. Secondly, in the current state, when we are mirrored, when we are uh, improving security by providing uh, distribution, we are going to see distribution concentration. If we are not careful, we are going to see concentration in one cloud service provider, which is a risk on its own. Therefore, companies should try to plan their infrastructure so that even cloud services are distributed uh, independent of the, uh, the cloud service providers. For instance, if your primary service is provided by provider A, then the backup service should be provided by service provider B. But that is a whole huge uh, issue on network security, on how do you actually relate on all these integrations. I think that one will uh, bring up a new phenomenon. Are we talking about using more of artificial intelligence to monitor all these transaction level activities? Um, I think I can give other people a chance to speak at that point. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. Thank you. I mean, I, I feel as though I'd love to let you to go on, but we've got to be brief because we've got to move on. Maria's got a question here. And, uh, um, and she mentions the point that uh, this is Marina Vittoria Giola. I hope I pro pronounced that correctly, Maria. Um, who said, often, security is often seen as a cost of uh, the business, sometimes not essential. This is a dangerous time not to be seen as essential. And her point is, how can it uh, um, disseminate and instill a better security culture worldwide, public and private? I suppose another way would be to say very briefly, how can it show value? Rinsky, if I can come to you for an answer first, and then I'll come very briefly to Stephen. Rinsky, your, your, your thoughts first. In terms of creating a better security culture, uh, yes. for me, that's all about uh, hands-on exercises, gaming elements. I use a lot of simulations and games, uh, card games, letting people walk around with sticky notes. This sounds very hands-on, right? This sounds like, oh, well, that's not strategy. Well, let me tell you, having people handheld from the top all the way down to the bottom in an organization, that's strategy to me. Yeah, because I see a lot of consultants and uh, strategic uh, advisors coming in and only talking to the top level, that's already converted, right? So where we actually see a lack in terms of that whole culture is the end to end, top to bottom, bottom to top, every single role in that organization changing their mind shift and mindset. And, and that's something that for me comes always with, yeah, something that people can remember, not just giving them something to read, not a procedure. You know, actually having hands-on exercises, like I said, uh, games and, and uh, yeah, have some fun with it, you know, change the whole perception of people having this, you know, all security and risk and BCP that's either boring or it's, it's internally focused. It doesn't make money as such. It only costs money. All of that to change that around by actually, uh, yeah, by showing people the actual benefits, even if an incident never happens, you know, and having, having that better internal culture. Thank you very much indeed. Steve, let me come back to you since um, we've, we've, we've managed to get you back. On this issue, and it's a really big issue that's cropped up on these webinars. In fact, we might have a webinar on it in a few, a few couple of weeks about this value proposition. And some people have said, as indeed uh, Maria's question uh, is tantamount to, the trouble is security isn't showing its value and impact on the bottom line. When the recession comes that follows, it's gonna be on the run. Stephen, very briefly once again, your thoughts on that? and the counter to it? Uh, I think uh, we, are un, uh, we are not giving the right value to security because um, as you realize, when the pandemic started, the shutdown was not planned. But we are, we are not seeing catastrophic events or catastrophic results of lack of security. What I see is actually security was, was good uh, to a, a very high level. And we were only lucky because after that chaotic dis uh, distortion, you should have seen that a lot of uh, security loopholes have been exploited. Not, not exactly. Um, I also want to be a little bit uh, uh, different here. I see the role of security moving away from the individuals the staff of the company to service providers 
and to uh, security technical people who are going to look at things running in the cloud, things which are not running with us. I can see that business continuity is moving out of the offices um, and we are going to be reliant more on systems and distributed cloud over, over the internet. What does that mean? It means security to the end user is not as critical as it is to the backend user because the backend user now controls the security. Maybe that one can kick us to think uh, going forward. Thank you very much, Stephen. I must say, some absolutely amazing and some fantastic questions. Uh, um, and once again, another webinar where we could be going on for another hour, I'm sure. Let me just um, ask each of my panel then for their um, their final thoughts on this issue. And uh, I suppose the big issues for business continuity and security, um, what are the big issues going forward from here? Glenn, in just 20 seconds, if you wouldn't mind your final thoughts, please. I would just consider how can you seek to not just operationally but strategically enable the business. Find what value you have in that, find what processes you can contribute to and then clearly communicate that and make sure your information and what you can do for the business is available to all. Thank you very much indeed. Shannon, the same thing to you. Your final comments, just 20 seconds please. The big issues from now. Yep, to echo what Glenn said, it's about communication. It's about translating technical risk into a lingua franca or a common language for the businesses of which you're in, involved with and aligning your intent with their overall business strategy to ensure that they understand your value add and to ensure that whatever you're doing is supporting the business and isn't just seen as a cost. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to go to... Uh, um, uh, uh, Stephen, your final comment in 20 seconds, if you wouldn't mind, Stephen. Just big issue for you going forward. My final comments. Security is three aspects. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Current state, we are focusing on availability. Future state, we are going to, stay, to focus more on security. We are going, we are, it's a trade-off between confidentiality and availability. I think the, the twist now is focus more on availability as opposed to confidentiality. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen. I'm going to have to cut you off there, Stephen, because we've got to go to our, it's only appropriate, I leave my very final comment uh, um, of this webinar. Vinsky, your final thoughts, please. Just 20 seconds, if you wouldn't mind. Well, I think the overall um, culture shift that we need is we start allowing people to make mistakes and do all our planning, rehearsal, simulations in a way that is open, that is honest, that people are comfortable uh, saying what they think might be risky, etc. before a real incident happens and, uh, and encourage that type of thinking in, uh, in staff as well as management to, uh, yeah, to have that, uh, that comfort level with uh, making a mistake here and there before the real incident. Thank you very much indeed. Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, final comment and uh, um, not one that I've heard uh, before. Thank you very much indeed to that. Thank you very much indeed to the panel. Thank you for all the questions as well. I'm so conscious. There were so many. I didn't have a chance to get through them. Thankfully, we managed to get Stephen on board um, and, and good that he was able to connect from Uganda. Uh, um, so thank you very much indeed to uh, um, Business As Usual for taking this on and sponsoring this initiative. What a great conversation. That, um, um, and I'm gonna, I think it will feed into uh, many of the uh, other webinars that are coming up. And thank you also to our supporters uh, for they continually stand by us as we uh, go to uh, um, uh, future webinars. A little word in please for OSPA nominations. Um, this is about who are the outstanding people. Let's find out who they are. Let's celebrate success. Let's find out who are outstanding and not really good. Uh, India, uh, US, Benelux, Kenya, Romania remain open. Australia too. We had two Australians on the panel today. So let's put in a call for Australia and to let you know UK opens on the 1st of July. Ospers are the recognitions of those who are truly outstanding. And uh, as you know, we are here every Tuesday and Thursday, have been from the beginning. And next Tuesday, uh, uh, we go through all over again, a completely different topic, uh, looking at the uh, job complexity of modern security officers. Those with us on Tuesday will know we set ourselves up for that one rather well, as we have actually for the one next Thursday today. 
Um, so thank you very much indeed once again to uh, my panel. Thank you very much indeed to the audience from around the world for your questions. Uh, very much look forward and hope that you'll join us again next week. Uh, um, just want to say a special thanks to my team in the background to uh, put all this together. I'm just the face at the front. Uh, and wherever you are in the world, stay safe.